Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I did during my PhD at Northern Arizona University and some of the work that I'm doing as a postdoc in Matt Ruding's lab at Thompson Rivers University. And in the broadest sense, my research seeks to contribute to our understanding of this fundamental question in biology, and that is the origin of the species and more generally the speciation process. And within this framework, I work typically with birds, and that's because birds exhibit relatively high diversity of morphology and behaviors among and even within species. And this makes them a great model organism to explore questions related to uh, speciation. And I'm particularly interested in the role of acoustic and visual signals such as song and plumage in speciation. And with birds, song and plumage are important signals because they're used to communicate potential fitness uh, to mates. And divergence of these signals can be an important driver in speciation when signals become so different that they're no longer being recognized as being from the same species. And that creates a situation called behavioral isolation. But acoustic and visual signals can vary at different rate, rates. But still, divergence of just one of these signals may still be enough to promote behavioral isolation in birds. And an example of this might be within Epidnex flycatchers. This is a, a genus that is thought to be cryptic and monomorphic, but heterospecific show clear vocal differences. And typically, species are delineated based on vocal differences within this genus. And a striking example of this is between willow and alder flycatchers. These two species were once considered conspecifics, but studies that looked at their song found structural differences, uh, which can be seen here with the spectrograms. These show frequency uh, on the y-axis and time across the x-axis. And importantly, the birds actually responded differently to these songs during behavioral experiments. And that confirmed that birds actually can recognize those song structural differences. And such a phenomenon may even be occurring at the subspecies level. For example, within little flycatchers, there are four subspecies. In the east, there is Empidnax trailii trailii, and this map is only showing the range in the U.S. Um, in the interior west, there is Empidnax trailii adastus. In the Pacific Northwest, there is Brewsteri, and in the Southwest, there's Empidnax trailii extimus. And this subspecies in the Southwest U.S. is listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The original subspecies designations were based on qualitative plumage descriptions from mainly museum specimens. And recently there has been one quantitative study that did find differences on the back and the crown. But this study has been criticized because it only looked at reflectance of the plumage from the 400 to 700 nanometer, which is the human visual range but birds can see into the UV from 300 to 700 nanometers. And so this study did not look at that potential importance of the UV signal for delineating subspecies. That study was also criticized because there were, uh, it was done on live birds in the field. And so there were no reference specimens for future studies to revisit. And importantly, it's unknown if birds could actually perceive those differences in color. Regarding song, there has been one study that only looked at two of the subspecies, Impidnax trailii, Adastus, and Extimus. And so the two other subspecies are unstudied. And that study did find differences between Adastus and Extimus, but there have been no behavioral experiments to determine if birds could actually recognize song structural differences among the subspecies. And so the main goal of my PhD research at Northern Arizona University was to reassess the plumage and song differences in willow flycatchers, and also to take it a step further and ask, okay, if there are statistical differences in plumage and song, can birds actually perceive those differences? So to revisit song, I use spectrophotometry, and this uh, photograph here is an image of a spectrophotometer, and this instrument, at the end of this instrument, there's a a light source that shines light onto an object and it measures the amount of light that's reflected from that object. And using that raw reflectance data, you can make reflectance plots, which are shown here. This is a um, just a, 
fake data, but this is uh, the y-axis is showing percentage of light reflectance from 300 to 700 nanometers. And so this instrument allows me to look at the amount of UV reflectance um, on willow flycatcher plumage. And I did this using museum specimens mainly so that future studies could revisit the same specimens and potentially scrutinize my research. Um, and I did this using specimens that had been collected across the range within the, the US, uh, which is shown in this map. And I restricted my specimens to only adults that had been collected during peak breeding periods from June 15th to July 20th. And I measured reflectance on three dorsal patches, the back, nape, and the crown, and then three ventral patches, belly, breast, and throat. And for the sake of time today, I'm only going to present results from the back and the crown, but the results on the other uh, plumage patches are similar. And so this is what I found. These are the reflectance plots for the back and the crown. Again, this is the y-axis showing percentage reflectance from 300 to 700 nanometers. And the curves here are color-coded for each subspecies. And what we see is, first of all, there's, there's really no big peak in the UV. So there doesn't seem to be this, you know, really diagnostic or, or, or really important UV signal. Um, and we also see that generally, even for um, uh, Empinex uh, alnorum, which is an alder flycatcher, which I included as an outgroup, generally the curves are the same for all four subspecies and even this outgroup. We do see one subspecies of willow flycatchers that's reflecting a bit more, um, and that's Empinex trailii extimus, the endangered subspecies. Uh, but it's sort of hard to see what's going on here. Um, so I wanted to take this step further and, and ask, okay, there, there might be some slight differences here, but can birds actually perceive these color differences? And one approach to do this is to statistically model color within um, a, a statistical model space that accounts for differences in avian visual systems. Uh, birds have a, a unique visual system in that they have four cones that are sensitive to different types of wavelengths. They have one cone type that's sensitive to UV, one cone type that's sensitive to short wavelengths, medium wavelengths, and long wavelengths. Human only have these three cone types. And within this four cone type um, statistical space, if you were to model plumage coloration, and they grouped in space by subspecies, this would be evidence that the birds could actually perceive the color differences between subspecies. And so this is what I, uh, these are the, the tetrahedral spaces for the back and the crown. And when we plot the subspecies and the outgroup alder flycatchers within that color space, this is where they fall out. And if we expand it, what we can see is that there's just lots of overlap between all of these taxa. So based on these results, we don't have strong evidence that color is used to discriminate among subspecies and maybe not even amongst species within this group. And so maybe some of the reflectance differences that we found uh, could be for other reasons like thermoregulation or crypsis, but we just don't have good evidence that the color differences contribute to discriminating subspecies. So in the next part of my dissertation, I looked at song differences, and I again included all four subspecies within uh, the U.S. range. And in this part, I only looked at the, the willow flycatcher subspecies. I didn't include the alder flycatcher outgroup. And uh, these were based on field recordings that I made in the field or gathered from the Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology, McCullough Library. And these are the spectrograms for each subspecies. Again, this is uh, frequency on the Y and time on the X axis. I'm gonna play some of the songs here and I just want you to see if you can hear any structural differences. So this is one subspecies, Adastus. And I'll play it again for you. Oops. So that's one. And then this is the Extimus subspecies. And then I'll play it one more time. Uh, 
And some of you might be better birders than I am. I really can't hear many differences there. So I need to do something a little more quantitative. So what I did was I, I looked at 41 aspects of the song structure uh, to see if there are differences among, among songs here. And to give you an idea of what I did, I broke the song down into three phrases, the first, second, and third phrase. And then within each phrase, I measured temporal and frequency measurements for each of these notes. So I would measure the duration of this note here, and then also the, the low and the high frequency. And then I also counted the number of frequency modulations in the third phrase here. And this is just a simple count of the number of peaks here that you see where the song, the frequency modulates up and down. And then using all of these, the, these 41 um, structural characteristics, I reduced them down to the important components using a principal components analysis to look for differences among subspecies. And this is what I found. This figure shows the first principal component on the x-axis and the second principal component on the y-axis. This, uh, the first principal component looks like it's getting blocked here, but this is really um, what is loading heavily on the first principal component is the minimum frequency. So songs over here have a higher minimum frequency and songs over on this part of the axis have a lower minimum frequency. And then the y-axis is correlated with fewer frequency modulations and it's actually switched here so songs up here have fewer frequency modulations and songs down here have more frequency modulations so if we put up uh, spectrograms here songs that end up over here are representative of this spectrogram here and songs that ended up over here are representative of this spectrogram and so when we do a permutational um, analysis of variance, we find that there are differences in two of these groups here. One group is made up entirely of Empidnax trailii extimus, and the other group is made up of the other three subspecies, and then a few of those uh, extimus songs. And so really the take home from this figure is that song is, is really different in that extremist group, but song is similar among the other three subspecies. So then I wanna take this a step further and, and ask, okay, do birds actually recognize these song structural differences? And so to do this, I conducted territorial intrusion playback experiments across the range in the US of willow flycatchers um, at these sites shown on this map. And what I did at each site was I first identified a putative uh, male, territorial male that was singing in a territory. And I, after an observation period, determined the approximate center of the territory. And in the center of the territory, I placed a speaker. And then I randomly selected and played one subspecies song to that focal individual. After that song had played, um, for a period of time. I stopped the song, uh, left the area for a period of 30 minutes to allow that bird to recover. After 30 minutes, I returned and again played another randomly selected subspecies song. And I repeated this until the focal individual had received all four subspecies songs and a white noise control. And uh, during each of these playback trials, I recorded typical behaviors such as the time for the bird to initially respond, the approach distance the, boat, the bird came to the speaker, the time it spent near the speaker, and the number of times it called or sang. And then I assumed that a bird that responded faster, spent more time near the speaker, sang more and called more, was considered an aggressive response and therefore had recognized that song. Using all those behaviors, I again used a principal components analysis to reduce them down to the important components that ex explain the variation in behavioral responses. And this is what I found. This figure shows the first principal component on the y-axis. Positive PC1 scores represent a more aggressive response. Negative PC1 scores represent a less aggressive response. And then on the x-axis is the stimulus type, so the four subspecies song and the white noise control. And the title refers to the subspecies identity of the focal individual. And so in the Adastus range, individuals responded most aggressively to songs that are similar in structure and less aggressively to songs that are different in structure and the white noise control. 
These results were similar in the Bruce Dry range, where they responded most aggressively to their own subspecies song and those that are similar in structure and less aggressively to extimus and the white noise control. These results were similar in the Trailei range, where birds responded most aggressively to their own subspecies song and those that are uh, similar in structure and less aggressively to extimus, which is different in structure. And finally, in the extimus range, individuals responded most aggressively to their own subspecies song and less aggressively to the other three subspecies and the white noise control. So we actually do have evidence that birds can uh, perceive the structural differences that we find in song. And so it seems as though song, but not plumage, is diverging among populations of willow flycatchers. And I wanted to take this a step further and try to tease apart what, what are the mechanisms that are driving song divergence within the willow flycatcher group. And there could be lots of things that cause song to diverge. And Rebecca Safran's group at um, Colorado University Boulder has spent a lot of time thinking about this idea. And they've developed a framework to help researchers tease apart the mechanisms that contribute to signal divergence. And there are several mechanisms that are particularly important for the willow flycatchers. The first is genetic drift. Willow flycatchers occur in these isolated populations across the landscape, and adults show relatively high breeding site fidelity, meaning they come to the same site to breed year after year. And juveniles don't really uh, disperse very far from um, their their natal breed, uh, their natal natal grounds. Um, they only really disperse up to 200 kilometers. So we're not seeing a whole lot of gene flow between these subspecies boundaries. And so within this framework, you would expect song distance to be correlated with genetic distance or in the absence of genetic data, geographic distance. Another thing that might be contributing to song divergence is adaptation to the abiotic environment. Um, willow flycatchers occur across a broad climactic gradient and that could cause song to diverge um, due to vegetation changes that are caused by the climate or just uh, directly on song transmission, humidity and, and temperature effects affect transmission of acoustic signals in the environment. So with, uh, within this framework, you would expect that song distance would, would also be correlated with some sort of climate distance in the environment. Also, morphological adaptation could cause song to diverge. We know that uh, bill shape and size and body size also contribute to um, the frequency of sounds that animals make. And so within this framework, you would predict that uh, a song trait that is sensitive to body size changes, such as song frequency, would be negatively correlated to body size or bill size, simply because of this phenomenon that larger animals produce lower frequency sounds. And then finally, sexual selection might be contributing to song divergence. And under this hypothesis, you would predict that some song trait would be correlated to reproductive success. So I've continued to study this system. And in a paper that I'm working on with an undergraduate researcher from Northern Arizona University, we looked at those first two questions about genetic drift and uh, local adaptation in song divergence. And what we found was there is support for uh, both genetic drift and local adaptation. In this first figure here, we found that acoustic distances between songs are correlated with geographic distance. We didn't have genetic data, so we used geographic distance as a proxy. And we also found that acoustic distances are correlated with climate distances. So these two aspects might be contributing to willow flycatcher song divergence. Uh, we also looked at morphological adaptation, and we looked at uh, body size, specifically in bill size. And for body size, we used the wing cord um, size, and uh, bill size is just the, the size of the bill, the length of the bill. And uh, we used measurements from this paper by Phil Unit in 1987, and, and we used his body size measurements for each subspecies. And what we found was that Song PC1, which again is highly correlated with that low minimum frequency, 
um, is not correlated to body size, and it's also not correlated to bill size. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of evidence for morphological adaptation con contributing to song divergence in willow flycatchers. And so I'm also curious in the role of sexual selection in willow flycatchers. And again, just to remind you, the, the main um, uh, song aspect that is contributing or, or is different among subspecies is that minimum song frequency. And so I thought, okay, maybe there's some sort of sexual selection for that minimum song frequency. And so what we did was in Arizona, we monitored uh, nest success of a population of willow flycatchers and then correlated their song characteristics to their reproductive success. And you might ask, okay, how do you measure uh, reproductive success in birds? Well, this is a video of um, us in the field monitoring nests. This is just a, a camera that's on the end of the pole, a telescoping pole and you can raise it up to the nest and observe inside the nest. And so you know exactly the reproductive output of individuals and you can easily correlate song traits to their reproductive um, output. And this is what I found. This, these two figures show minimum song frequency on the x-axis and the y-axis shows nestlings on the left and fledglings on the right. And what we find is that both of nestlings and fledglings are positively correlated to minimum song frequency. Now, this is, um, there's some important caveats with this. First of all, you can see there's a lot of variation here. So clearly there's you know, the, the, it doesn't seem like this is uh, very strongly correlated to reproductive success. Um, and also this is this is apparent nest, nest success. We did not do any sort of uh, paternity test to figure out if um, there's any sort of extra pair paternity going on here. So there's some important caveats to this slide, um, but it's an interesting finding and one that I would like to continue studying um, moving forward. So we have um, evidence that song could be song divergence could be caused by a lot of things. Uh, it could could be because of genetic drift. It could be because of local adaptation. There's some evidence for sexual selection, but we can at least rule out uh, based on the data that we have that body size and morphological adaptation um, is not contributing to song divergence within this group. So now I'd like to move on and. Um, switch gears and talk about some of the work that I'm doing at uh, in Matt Ruding's lab at the Behavioral Ecology and Conservation Lab at TRU. And I was basically hired by Matt to come on and help his students understand and think about the mechanisms behind trait variation in animals. And in a recent project that we just finished up, we were interested in the plumage variation in mountain bluebirds. And mountain bluebirds, shown in this figure here, this is a male on the right and a female on the left. They, they're, they're, the blue coloration um, of these birds is a really unique type of coloration. Um, unlike the red coloration that we see in a bird such as a house finch shown here, um, where the red coloration comes from the diet and the food in uh, the chemicals in the diet are directly deposited into the feathers during molt, which create this brilliant red color. The blue coloration that we see in mountain bluebirds is not caused by a pigment. It's caused by the microstructure of the feathers, and it reflects the light in such a way so that it appears blue to the observer. And so because of this, because of it's, a, it's a structural component that causes this coloration, the sources of variation among individuals is not well known because it's not directly linked to diet. So we wanted to explore this question about what is causing individual variation in uh, blue coloration in mountain bluebirds. And we had a couple of hypotheses. We said, okay, maybe it's age related. So just like these dogs here where the puppy has this really nice brown coat and this older individual um, has kind of this grayish coat. Maybe this is something that's similar with mountain bluebirds where 
the older individuals can't contribute as much resources, allocate as many resources to their feathers during molt, so they appear less blue with age. And we also had this hypothesis that, okay, it could be weather related, where individuals that are molting during periods that are um, fair weather might um, experience less feather wear, feather degradation, than individuals that are molting during periods um, of poor weather, of a lot of rain. So we thought, okay, if you're, if you're molting during fair weather, then you might experience less wear and tear, so you might appear more blue. Um, so we tested these two hypo hypotheses simultaneously in the same paper uh, using a population of bluebirds around Kamloops, Kamloops. And it was a great data set. It was 10 years old. It was lots of individuals. And this is what we found. Uh, these figures show the coloration on the tail. This is from a principal components analysis. Positive PC1 scores are individuals that are more blue. And this is on the left is female and on the right is male. And the x-axis are the age categories that they went into. And from this, we found that um, individual, bluebird individuals are actually getting more blue as they age. And also males are generally more colorful than females. So this is somewhat of a surprising result that individuals are actually getting more blue um, as they age. It was an unexpected result for us. And then we also looked at the weather and it looks like it's getting caught here, but the, the y-axis again shows um, tail PC1 where positive scores are more blue. And this is showing July temperature on the x-axis. And these results are a bit more complicated. Um, the darker points here are um, older individuals. So ASY um, after second year and the light blue individuals are younger individuals, um, which were categorized as second year. And this is for female and male. And for both females and males, older individuals don't respond to these temperature changes in July, but the younger individuals are getting more colorful during molting periods that are have higher July temperatures. And this is just one of the one of the weather metrics that we that we uh, looked at in this study. Um, but the results were similar, where the weather is affecting color, but it's dependent on age and sex. So it's kind of a, a, a complicated result as to what's going on here. We're also doing several projects uh, about to understand body size evolution. And, and body sizes is really important um, characteristic in an animal that predicts so much about its life history. It predicts things like its uh, reproduction, its metabolism, even things like its range size, just to name a few. And there are several hypotheses to explain how body size um, changes across animal groups um, and changes evolutionarily. Um, and one of those hypotheses is referred to as Foster's rule or island rule or island syndrome. And it says that mainland populations, if you're a large animal and you're on the mainland, you're typically gonna, um, you're gonna be large. And if you migrate to or, or colonize an island system, uh, you might become small. So we would call that um, dwarfism. And if you're on the mainland and you're a small animal and you colonize an island, um, it's hypothesized that you actually get bigger and we would call this gigantism. And so we're interested in seeing, this has really been studied mostly in uh, mammal groups. And we were interested in seeing, okay, do these, does this same rule apply to birds? We were interested in how generalizable this rule is. And what we're finding is in a study that I'm doing with um, Aaron Veal, Matty Ood, Nathan Smith, and Matt Rudink is that overall, birds do conform to the island rule and what we're finding is they are getting bigger overall but when we broke when we break it down to individual orders we see that some groups we're, see, we're seeing gigantism like in woodpeckers between mainland and, and island systems but in other groups we're seeing a dwarfism so like in ducks here between mainland and island systems we're actually seeing a dwarfism and in other groups, we're seeing no change. And so 
what we're finding is that the island rule, although it's sometimes presented as this really generalizable rule, uh, that doesn't seem to hold with birds, where in some groups we're seeing gigantism, other groups we're seeing dwarfism, and other groups still we're seeing no change. And we're also looking at this um, in bats, and that's because body size in bats is a really important predictor of its extinction risk. And this is a project that I'm doing with Charlotte Hutchinson, Morgan Riegelhoff, Eric Bodos, and Matt Rudink. And what we're finding in this study is that bats are um, experiencing gigantism, where populations on the mainland are smaller um, generally than populations on the islands. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of the um, Behavioral Ecology and Conservation Lab at TRU. It's a really great group and we're thinking about questions about speciation and trait evolution. And um, it's just an exciting time to be looking at these questions, especially since we have so many phylogenomic statistical tools at our fingertips. Um, and so I'd like to give a shout out to Matt Rudink and the other people in the lab that have contributed to um, the projects that I presented today. And there's been a lot of other help uh, that I, um, during my PhD and uh, from a lot of folks at NAU and at other organizations. So I'd like to acknowledge them as well. And if I have time, I'll take some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Sean. That was really super interesting. Um, I don't know if you have your chat box pulled up there, but you do have a question in the chat for you, if you know how to do that. Um, if not, I can just read Yep, yeah. yep. Awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Thanks, Jess, for that question. Yeah, so those, it was um, completely randomized. Uh, it, even though I presented it in a way that seemed like, yeah, I might have been doing the same same one each time. Um, but yeah, so it was it was totally randomized. And then um, in, in the analyses that I do and in the paper, we um, also included uh, order as a random effect to sort of, to try to account for any sort of desensitization uh, from the stimulus type. So yeah, that was, that's a, a good statistical uh, question. I appreciate it. I also had a question about the song variation aspect of your study. So I know there's been a lot of research re recently on how um, like anthrop anthrop uh, anthropogenic noise or like urban and city noise is affecting song frequency in birds. Did you ever look at that or have you come across that in the research at all? Yeah, that is um, something, you know, it's not, I don't work in that sort of, in a system where, where that's, um, you know, really going on like a main driver. I don't work in urban ecology is what I'm saying. Uh, but it definitely could be contributing to song variation in willow flycatchers. It could be another, you know, pressure to to change frequency um, because of anthropogenic noise. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, it, it could be happening. Some of the populations that I have recordings from, uh, you know, one off the top of my head is it was in Philadelphia. Um, and so, so there definitely is a lot of noise in Philadelphia. Uh, and, you know, some of the populations in the Southwest are just totally remote. You can only access them by, by river. Um, so there's a lot less anthropogenic noise there. So it, it could be, it could definitely be contributing to song divergence and it could be another pressure that they have to deal with. Um, I just haven't looked at it, but that's a great question and something that I'd like to think about and, and test in the future, yeah. Cool. It looked like Mercy had a question. Yeah, my question is just I understand that like flycatchers as a whole, like all the 
and Pitonax species are pretty complicated with lots of subspecies. So has the type of work that you did with willow flycatchers been done to help discern subspecies of any other flycatchers? Yeah, I, um, well, I'm not sure, at, uh, I'm not sure like officially if it's, uh, if my research has contributed to, you know, like official subspecies designations. Um, but we, you know, some of the, the, the way we approach the, the question that we were asking was based on a lot of, um, you know, previous research that had been done in and Pinnax flycatchers, but also in Tyranids um, more generally, where the species look really similar based on plumage, but but among species and even within species, they they show these vocal differences. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I was just curious if this was like a common approach or if you were like a a pioneer of this, but yeah, that answers it. <laughs> no, I can't, I don't, I definitely can't say that I'm a pioneer for, for this sort of, this sort of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think generally it's important to, um, you know, cause, cause a lot of people will say, well, you need to include genetics into this, uh, or you need to include genomics into this. But I think it's important to think about, you know, the behavioral response of animals. And just because we find some sort of point mutation or uh, a difference in, in mitochondrial DNA doesn't necessarily mean that, that those differences are, you know, meaningful to the birds themselves. Right. Like what's um, actually ecologically relevant. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's important to, to use genetics and, and look at uh, morphological differences or, or differences in, in phenotypes, but also to really ask, okay, what's the behavioral response? How do birds perceive these differences? So yeah, that that's a that's a, a great question, Mercy. Cool, thank you. So it looked like Anna had a question about population density. Um, yeah, I, uh, she, the question is, could density of willow flycatchers affect their territorial behavior um, and so their response? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, the, the, the thing that I would say is that they were, you know, the, the birds were all, the focal individuals that we tested were all acting territorially. Um, so they were singing, they were singing on multiple perches. So it was really easy to kind of spot map their territories. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't look at things like, yeah, po um, population density, uh, but that's a good point. Maybe if, if some birds are really packed in, um, maybe they're just, may, I don't know, maybe they're, they're less aggressive, less responsive. Um, then if yeah the the density was a little bit a little bit lower um, one thing one thing this sort of indirectly I think um, addresses your question one thing that we did was we made sure that the stimulus that we presented to the focal individual was a recording that was was not from the population that we were testing. Um, so I don't, I, that was kind of one way to, to think about, you know, how population differences and, um, but um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really look at uh, the things like density, but that, that's, that's a, that's a good point. I had another question just about, you know, working with the museum specimens like you did for your your plumage coloration analysis. I, guess, I think that's really interesting and something I've never done before. So I was just wondering how, you know, with the color spectrometer that you were using, does age of specimens affect that? Or yeah, if you just talk a little bit more about that, that process and that experience, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, so that is, that is a huge concern. Um, you know, feathers, even in a museum, they can, 
they can degrade over over time. Um, so what we did was we we just built that into our st statistical model. So we we included age as a fixed effect in um, our analyses. Um, and in the, uh, there was one, I think it was on the throat. Um, age was there was a significant um, effect of age, but for the others, there there really wasn't. Um, and that's what's you know in the, in the plumage literature, that's what that's the recommendation. Um, you can you just you can and, and with mixed models, it's really easy to do. You just include age as a as a fixed effect. Um, so so yeah, it's it, that's a good question, Nick and. Um, it's something you definitely have to think about if you're if you're going to work with museum specimens. Awesome. Um, anybody else have any questions? You can either turn on your mic or put in the chat. If not, I guess we'll uh, start wrapping it up. So, thanks so much, Sean, for your talk. It was really really great. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. I know it's late on a Friday, so I appreciate uh, you folks coming in to listen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, um, in two weeks, we have another seminar. So um, keep an eye out for that poster that will be circulated in about a week or so. Other than that, we'll uh, see you next time. So thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Sean.